welcome to this evening. I have to say as a, well, my name is Amini Sanati and I'm a local mom, a community member here. I'm also a social worker and just a fierce advocate for social justice. And I am very happy to be a part of this evening and I felt compelled to do something. I'm also a delegate, which many of you helped to elect me become a delegate to our Democratic Party here for our district. And one of the reasons why I felt compelled to do this is because, for example, when I became a delegate, I found out about the whole Cal Dems, you know, the day Dem elections that no one really knew about. And as someone who's very active with the party and, you know, very active in, in very much a political junkie, it makes me very excited. I thought, how had I never heard about this? So I feel like this is something, uh, it's a disservice to the community. So it was our job to crack the mystery, get more of us engaged. And I feel like we're doing the same thing right now with Neighborhood Council. This is another elected body that's making this for us. And regardless of uh, whether it's blue or red, because it's a, it's a nonpartisan election, we are still electing people who will make decisions for us with their value system, with their ethics. And it would be really nice if we had people who rep represented our values. And I think that as Democrats, that we have a very big stake in this because this seems to be the only elected body in our area that's overwhelmingly blue that just reflects the same way. And I think it's an overlooked, um, an overlooked area that has now become uncovered and that's so many wonderful people getting involved. So thank you. I see people are coming in. Uh, we have many wonderful people on our extended panel tonight. It's gonna be a little bit of a discussion, a little bit of a panel, a little bit of Q and A. But the, the reason why I actually thought that I had to do this is because the last neighborhood council meeting I was in, uh, one of our council members tried to set the record straight, so to speak, because there's been a lot of banter you know, in our community, as we know about the homeless crisis, about our unhoused population. And this is just a perfect example about misinformation gone crazy. And I'm just feeling PTSD from the last election that we just finished in November. So coming off of that, seeing this sort of stuff happening in our community and seeing a lot of people making their decisions based on false information, I thought, okay, well, I was elected to be the delegate. I should do something about this. And that's why I thought after watching Heather Tuttle, who's going to be joining us this evening, uh, get shut off. And after witnessing our council members who have courageously stood up to speak in support of logic, in support of solutions, and in, in support of you know, values that I believe in, seeing the way they've been treated as a result of the vitriol that's resulted from this time, I thought there has to be a better way that we can come together and have a discussion and listen and hear what they have to say and not just mute them when they stop talking. So here I am. Thank you again for coming. And I would like to uh, have everybody, our, the panelists, the candidates that are going to be running for um, the, this particular election, I'd like for them to introduce themselves, except Heather, because Heather will introduce herself with uh, Cord Thomas and Sylvia Wilson when they do a presentation. So here we go. I can go first. Hello, everyone. My name is Alfredo Hernandez, and I'm running for the at-large one seat. Very happy to be here and appreciate you all joining us tonight. Hi, I'm Andy Siwak. I am running for the District 12 director seat, which is the Osage neighborhood. I've lived in the neighborhood for 10 years. I currently serve in the Government uh, Affairs Committee, and I'm so thankful for Amanis and for putting this together. This is going to be a great event. Hi, my name is Carrie. I'm running for the community organization director, excuse me. Um, I live in the Kentwood area and have um, lived here for about six years, but been involved in the community about eight years. I have four kids um, who uh, came to school here before we lived here. And that's how we knew we wanted to live here after uh, commuting back and forth. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy Skura. I'm running to represent District 8, which is South Kentwood. I've lived in Westchester for about 18 years now and have been involved in the local community, helping to build the school where I work as a pediatric physical therapist. And I'm running to help bring uh, greater transparency and outreach to our neighborhood council. Thank you guys for being here. Hi, everyone. My name is Corey Burkett. I'm running for District 10 residential seat in Westport Heights, where I live. I've lived in the community for 24 years, first in Playa del Rey and now in Westchester. 
And I'm a local mom and a business owner, and I'm running because I want to be a part of making this community a wonderful place to be with engaged citizens who are involved and caring. And thank you for this opportunity to be here with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Cueto. I'm running for the uh, service club uh, seat as a member of Westchester Rotary Club. I'm also the owner and pharmacist of Westchester Pharmacy, uh, born and raised in Westchester. And um, just want to get involved and see the council change. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Faniza Mohammed, and I am running for the education seat. I am currently a coordinator at Wright Middle School STEAM and Gifted Magnet. And I have been living here for about maybe eight years. I also went to school in the area and I am committed to just bringing a voice that will stand up for our families, our community of students, and also uh, the people that work at our local schools. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this. Uh, so let the evening begin. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jana Copula. Um, I'm running for the residential district four seat. Uh, it's in West Westchester. We live behind the high school. Um, I live, I've actually lived in Playa Vista, in Playa del Rey, and in Westchester for um, about 16 years now. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a board certified music therapist, and I am running because I really want this neighborhood council to accurately represent the neighborhood that we live in and the diversity that it brings. So I'm really glad you're all here. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amanis, for the opportunity. Hello, my name is Jennifer Busher. I am running for the at-large community interest director seat. I have lived in Westchester and worked in Playa Vista since 2015. Um, I've spent most of that time uh, having babies and being caught up in very young children life. Uh, so now seems like a good opportunity now that they're slightly older and in the background. Uh, now seems like a good time to try to get more engaged in our neighborhood and our community. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Louis Maggiato. I am running for the Playa Vista residential street. I live in Playa Vista, but it's safe to say that my heart has always been in Westchester. It's where our three kids went to school for 11 years, and it seems like most of our activities are the ones we do in Westchester. Uh, I'm a television editor and producer, and I'm running because I've always made room in my life to give back to the community in various ways. And this feels like a much needed way to give back uh, in this next phase of my life. So thank you all for being here. And even though we're just 26 people, that's a significant percent of the electorate in this election. So uh, your votes matter. Um, we get I'm so sorry. <laughs> is it is it my turn? Sorry. I'm afraid my video is not working, but um, I'm Sherry Lambie. I'm running for the business seat for 90293. Um, I live and work here in beautiful Playa del Rey. I've lived in the community for 17 years. Um, I'm a small business owner, graphic designer, progressive, a wife to a special needs teacher and a mom. And I'm really sorry, I can't get this working. I don't know why it says my connection's unstable and I really don't know what to do about that, but really happy to be here. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Popescu. I'm running for the residential district two seat, which is upper Playa del Rey. Um, I have lived here since my husband and I bought our home in 2017. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Grassroots Neighbors, and I'm running because we've just seen the enormous amount of generosity and compassion and care in this community, and I want that to be reflected in our neighborhood council as well. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And once again, I know everybody's juggling a lot, kids, no kids. I mean, if you have to come and go, please do as you need to. I'm just very uh, grateful to see so many people involved. I mean, this is a start. Someone tells someone else. And I know other people are gonna be watching the video later, but um, this is the time to get engaged. So thank you. Uh, Alfredo, actually, Alfredo Hernandez can join us uh, for a limited time because, well, I'll let him explain it to you, but 
uh, I wanted to ask uh, the question because he couldn't stay the whole time. Something got sprung on him earlier this morning and uh, I wanted to make sure we got to hear from him though. So I wanna make sure I ask him this question. We had a few questions submitted, a few that I wrote and I think we'll just go at it. So Mr. Hernandez. Yes. You ready? <laughs> yes, ma'am. What can our neighborhood council do to support our local businesses and community not nonprofits? That's a that's a great question. But I, I before I answer that, I kind of want to address why I'm hopping off. I, I really apologize. I have to leave early. I was called into work today, basically saying we have to work on an election, a special election in New Mexico. So I'm after this call going to go train a bunch of organizers to hopefully get some more progressives elected. Um, you know, but what I you know, to that to that question, what role should our nonprofits and businesses be playing is really one of the reasons that I'm in this race. And it's because I strongly believe our neighborhood council can and really must play a larger role in coordinating and supporting these communities. Now, for me, it's undeniable that besides our beautiful environment, I'm a resident of Playa del Rey. I'm very, very lucky where I live. It's our network of small businesses and local nonprofit organizations that are our best asset. And if anything, COVID has really shown us that it's up to us as a community to make sure that our neighbors who have dedicated themselves to really enriching us all through those two institutions are supported. Now, I want a neighborhood council to begin building ironclad relationships with the business owners and the workers of our community. We should be surveying them semi-regularly to really understand their financial health. We should be marshalling our uh, you know, resources through grants and their resources to host more local events, you know, like Rock, Roll and Run's a really big one, Maybe we can be getting some art shows that showcase local talent, maybe some concerts at the park where we can raise money for great causes, grow the cultural capital of our people, and also support the folks that make this community what it is. But you know, to the second part of that, I also believe the Neighborhood Council should see our local businesses and nonprofits as really their foremost partners for community organizing. As I've you know, been walking around and visiting shops, I'm really dismayed at the lack of signs and flyers and storefronts. Now, granted, there are a few, but I think it really goes to show that our council hasn't been doing the best job at making these groups the front line of attack for our electoral outreach. Because there are issues that our nonprofits and businesses care about that our neighborhood council should be working with them to cooperate with, either through ad hoc committees or you know, through the ones that exist. Now, there are various nonprofits that really want to preserve the Bayona wetlands. The neighborhood council should be, you know, should be reaching out to them as our strongest allies and really organizing support for environmental initiatives. There are other nonprofits and organizations working to help our housing insecure and unhoused neighbors. The neighborhood council should be blasting opportunities across their various pages and platforms, getting everyone involved in supporting these organizations that are doing their part. Now, our current council sees their advisory status as reason to not get involved but I believe that it's because of our institutional power as a neighborhood council and the relationships we all as directors bring that we should understand that advisory position in a much broader sense, because there's really nothing stopping the neighborhood council from highlighting the great individuals that make up our small business and local nonprofits, both the people that own them and the people that work there, you know, the smiles that you see every time you walk into a store. We should be taking every opportunity to grow our community holistically. And it is my hope that if elected as you know, a member of that neighborhood council, I can start you know, us down that path through that part. But yeah, I, I really think that it is our nonprofits and our local businesses that are a key to you know, addressing a lot of the issues and a lot of the problems that we're seeing in our community today. So I really appreciate that question. Thank you. I, I think transparency, accountability, and working starting at grassroots is just tantamount to everything that you're talking about and everything that we absolutely need to do to build up our community. And I, the concerts, the art shows, I love all that. So thank you so much. Um, Alfredo, I know that time is of the essence and you have to hop on to get more uh, people who believe like us elected. So thank you for being here while you of could. Course. Thank you so much for putting on this event. Thank you everyone that's attending. You are in for a treat. It's a wonderful night of programming and just really enjoy. You know, there's a lot of hours that's gone into this, a lot of hours that have gone into the campaign because we really believe in a lot of the things that we're saying today. So I just hope that, you know, you all can get a, a nice little flavor of that and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye bye y'all. Thank you. And I have to say, having met every single one of you, I am so incredibly impressed by this 
group of individuals who stepped up to do this work. I really do believe in every single one of you. My heart is with this community and it manifests in different ways. And this is just one of the ways, a very important way that we must be involved if we really love our community. So thank you. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm excited for this too. So <laughs> without further ado, we have three of our current, or actually, uh, yes, we have three of our current council members. We're getting the screen sharing going. So tonight we have Cord Thomas, Sylvia Wilson, and Heather Tuttle, who will be sharing with us what, you know, what, what is our neighborhood council? A lot of people don't know it exists. A lot of Democrats don't know it exists. A lot of Democrats don't understand why this matters. A lot of people without knowing it exists, then you don't know what they do. We don't know about the budget. There's a lot we don't know. So please uh, tell us, current council members, what it's all about. Hey, Ama, before we jump into that real quick, just for the um, you know participants here today, if you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I know I see some people raising their actual physical hand and <laughs> raising their virtual hands. Drop those questions in the chat because we do have some questions that um, came in from people that RSVP'd or had questions um, that they emailed to Amanis. So all of those questions that kind of come in the chat, we're going to answer those at the end. Um, so especially right now, like what is Neighborhood Council? All those great questions that are going to come up. Um, if you can drop them in the chat, I'm going to keep track of them and then we'll try and get to all of them at the end. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you, Liz. We would not be able to do this without you. You did such a fabulous job for the homeless forum with the Democrat club. We, we had to ask you back. So thank you. <laughs> and, uh, yes, yeah, so let's go on to the next part because then we have a tight schedule. So you don't need to hear from me. Let's hear from the others. I think we're going to start with some introductions. So I think Cord, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Sorry, I've got a very loud bird chirping over me. So hi, I'm Cord Thomas. I've been a, uh, a member of the board for two years now. I'm from uh, Westchester, Westport Heights. I'm currently in Playa Vista. Um, uh, and uh, welcome. And I think most notably, I'm the chair of the outreach committee. And I heard a number of you uh, accurately proclaim that um, you know, there's not nearly enough familiarity with the neighborhood council. And so I hope to engage any and all of you who are interested in uh, doing better outreach in the coming future uh, uh, about our neighborhood council. So thank you. I'll hop in and introduce myself and then we'll hand it over to Sylvia. Um, my name is Heather Tuttle. I've served on the board for five years. The, the regular term is four years. I happened to join in 2016 when they were evening out the um, term. So my term ended up being five years, but typically half the board is elected two, ever, in a two year cycle. So this year it's the even seats and then some of the at large positions um, and the other positions like the community interest seat, the service organizations and the youth organizations, which happens to be the seat that I'm um, running for this election cycle. Um, so I also chair the education committee um, for the council and I am very extremely happy to be here tonight and to talk to you a little bit about what exactly our neighborhood council is and what we have done and what we hope to do and what we can do together. So I'm very much looking forward to um, speaking speaking to those points and to just um, be able to meet all of you, uh, e-meet e all of you tonight. So thank you so much for being here. Sylvia, take it away. Thank you so much, Heather. So again, I'm Sylvia Wilson. I have been on the Neighborhood Council for the past two years. I joined along with Cord and a few others. As Heather mentioned, uh, we have even and odd seats. I represent Residential District 7, of course, which is an odd seat. My seat will be up again in two years. Um, I have been in Westchester for the past 11 years, and I feel so grateful to be in this special community and to be with all of you tonight to talk about why it's so important for our neighborhood council to have the support of our local Democrats. And so we'll launch into that right now with our question, why should Democrats care about the neighborhood council of Westchester Playa? I changed the, I changed the slide, but it doesn't seem to be changing <laughs> on any, any advice on that not changing for you guys, right? You still see the title slide? There you go. There we, oh, go. There we go. I think it's just a little delayed. No, you're okay, back to present mode. Thank you, got it. <laughs> okay, so 
as many of us have shared, a lot of people aren't aware of the neighborhood council. Oftentimes when I'm out in the community speaking with our stakeholders and I, I'm mentioning my position on the board, people are like, what is that neighborhood council? I've never even heard of that. So obviously that's our job to take that more seriously, to get more people involved, to get them informed about what we do uh, as to the neighborhood council. So the neighborhood council system was established in 1999 as a way of ensuring that our city government remains responsive to the different needs and lifestyles of Los Angeles's rich variety of communities. It is the closest form of government to the people, right? Because we are the voice of the people. When our stakeholders, people who live within our communities have concerns, they often bring those to us. And then we give that information to our council member and the council members deputies to get whatever concerns that they have resolved to the best of our ability. So our local Westchester Playa uh, neighborhood council met for the first time actually in 2000. And our neighborhood council board members are city's officials. So we have to participate in ethics training. We have to sign a code of conduct, just like many other city officials who are elected by the members of their local communities. And we donate our time as volunteers. So we're not paid for this. We're doing this because we love our communities and we want our communities to be better. We have an invested stake. I know I have skin in the game. I have three young children who I'm thinking of in terms of the future of Westchester Playa and how I want their lives to be better. And I want to make sure that I'm doing everything within my power to make that possible. So we're advisory bodies. We don't have any legislative power. However, we do advocate for our communities with City Hall. The only person who represents our area of Westchester Playa who has legislative power is our current council member. Our annual budget is funded by taxpayer dollars. It's about $42,000 per year. And there are currently 99 neighborhood councils within Los Angeles. So there's, there's many. And they're each serving about 40,000 people. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I'll go into some of the ways that our neighborhood council has been advocates for the community. And a lot of um, what we do on the neighborhood council is done through committee work. So um, you'll notice much of, much of um, much of the accomplishments for the neighborhood council has come from directly out of committee. So we have a planning and land use committee um, and their most notable accomplishment uh, is definitely Playa Vista, which, you know, in the inception of the neighborhood council in, in 2000, Playa Vista looked very different than it does today um, back then. So it is the largest mixed use land development um, in, in much of the city. And I think it, it definitely surpassed um, Many of many of the visions of the the original neighborhood council planning and land use committee, who who dealt with it, but it does include an affordable housing area. Um, tons of new businesses have come in, and like we know, many residents as well. So another piece of uh, the planning and land use development committee was uh, the lower Playa development and that area with um, legato projects and and ensuring that Playa. Playa del Rey keeps its quaint little beach town feel. Um, so that's a, the Planning and Land Use Committee. Airport Relations has been another huge committee on our neighborhood council. Did I, I think I'm on the wrong slide. Did I, yep, we went two ahead, didn't we? Sorry about that. Um, the Airport Relations Committee definitely has been a huge advocate uh, for the airport modernization and the North Side project that is coming coming down the pipeline very quickly. So huge developments in the last 10 years at the airport. Homelessness is, uh, has never been an actual committee on the council, but it was developed as an ad hoc committee. Uh, and when that committee, when that ad hoc committee um, came to be about 10 years ago, they were engaging heavily with county uh, agencies such as PATH and LASA to help raise funds. There were some neighborhood purpose grants that were granted to PATH to help fund some county agencies and to help collaborate uh, with as the airport uh, had their eminent domain project and, and had to move some of the on house out of Manchester Square where they had been living for decades, uh, the neighborhood council really assisted with that on a with a weekly outreach program and 
were there um, as part of the ad hoc homeless committee. There's also been um, a public safety committee as part of the neighborhood council. We recently uh, heard from SoCal Gas Company as well as um, Food, and Water, Food and Water Watch as well as the Sierra Club to listen about SoCal Gas and um, the wetlands. Through public safety, we also get reports from our senior lead officers uh, about police reports and crime activity in the area. We also have an education committee. Uh, recently, LAUSD has reorganized the way that they do their, their, their schools. So they have a smaller version of the district called the community of schools. So the education committee this year has really been engaging with the administrators in the community of schools to to really strengthen the schools within our community and strengthen the pipeline to to engage local residents, uh, getting them to attend the local schools. We also have a community service committee, which has taken on a lot of the issues with homelessness in the in the community. Um, last year, right before the pandemic, the community service committee um, did an entire forum for services within the community, and they had it at the um, Covenant church and there was a a whole bunch of booths from around the city um just with the like the public library was there there were different church organizations there different rotary clubs um all kinds of different community service organizations all in one spot so that you could you could go and learn about them um on one weekend afternoon so just some of the things that the neighborhood council has done in recent years um, I'm going to go to the next slide of what else the Neighborhood Council could po potentially do, and I'll hand it over to Cord if you're still available. I am, yes. Uh, so I think the, uh, and, uh, again, I didn't know about the Neighborhood Council four years ago. Uh, a neighbor of mine uh, introduced me to it, and I found it to be a very, A, enlightening experience, and B, really wonderful to be able to engage in the community. And we engage and make impact in a number of ways. I think first and foremost, our community impact statements. So when city council is, is, is weighing in on whether to uh, uh, advocate for or vote for a position, a, a city council file, a motion by um, a city council member, um, the city council, the neighborhood council can uh, deliberate and author a community impact statement, which either supports or rejects or supports with conditions the, the city council motion. Um, and these are very seriously considered by city council when they are deliberating on a, on a motion. Uh, another area, so mentioned, typically we have roughly a $40,000 a year budget. A large, large part of that goes towards outreach, but also um, towards neighborhood purpose grants, which are grants towards not-for-profit organizations to support them in the work they do. Um, and so that's a wonderful experience to be able to support local not-for-profit organizations um, in a variety of means. Um, planning and land use uh, have great impact as Heather just described, um, because the city's uh, planning department strongly encourages developers to meet with the local neighborhood councils um, to review their plans and then the, the pluck, as we call it, um, uh, meets with them and asks for uh, clarification, concessions at times, and in, in many cases have had positive outcomes for the community in which the, the developer is working. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, the outreach committee specifically uh, engages in, in, in local community events um, and supports those community events financially, as well as takes that opportunity to promote awareness of the, the neighborhood council. Ideally, we would be working closely with our council member. And I wanna make it clear, we're not restricted to only working with Mike Vaughn and our, our current council member, but we can work with any city council member if there's a topic uh, you know, of interest or import to our neighborhood that may be on the agenda of another council member. Um, and finally, um, want to make sure that, you know, you're aware that, you know, everyone's a stakeholder, everyone can participate in meetings, and everyone can join also a committee. Um, we can have non-board members, and that's a very powerful way for local stakeholders interested in various topics, whether it's community service, 
for planning land use to get engaged in the neighborhood council. And it's a great way actually to sort of dip your toes into um, this form of government. So thank you. And then Cord, I didn't um, want to continue. Yeah. To sure, while well, I'm rolling. Own. Yeah, there, um, also the neighborhood council is part of an ecosystem of, of other um, coalitions and alliances. Um, and through those, you build, you know, momentum, build consensus. Um, and so some examples of that are the neighborhood council coalition, um, which are all 99 neighborhood councils uh, that meet and sometimes take positions on city council files, um, motions, issues of concern. Uh, there's the neighborhood council sustainability alliance, which uh, I think last is over 60 of the 99 neighborhood councils are officially uh, members of. Our neighborhood council is not a member of. We decided we couldn't get in, you know, in bed with uh, a, a sustainability alliance. Um, and then there's the RAC, which is the West Side uh, Regional Alliance of Councils, which is the handful of neighborhood councils on the West Side. Uh, that And all of these basically meet monthly. They have committees, they do activities. Um, and the idea is to just, you know, um, collaborate uh, on, on issues of concern. And then I thought, um, you know, just it's important also, uh, as, as both Heather and Sylvia said, our neighborhood council has sort of isolated itself from its major channels for advocating for our community um, because of various disagreements, frustrations, you name it. Um, so we have great opportunity. The council member Bonin and, and his office, his deputies, his field officers, they're all very eager to engage us. Um, sometimes they're too busy, uh, but they are eager to engage us. And then there are other city services, whether it's sanitation or transportation, street services, um, that are also great ways. We, we need to learn more about those and engage in them. And, and so I, I would just leave it at that. And, and welcome if the audience have other ideas and ways that, as again, you know, chair of the outreach committee, I'm very new to this, so welcome any other ideas. And I'm gonna mute. Thank you, Cord. Um, and now we'll just touch on, this is our, this is our last slide for the three of us that are current council members. Um, what can we do for each other as, um, as Democrats, as um, board members on the neighborhood council? What, what else could we do and how could we um, engage with one another? And I think it starts with um, some, building some more awareness and some more involvement on the, on the council. Um, the council has really shied away from or has not touched on um, some of the issues with climate change. Um, we do not have a current committee, an environmental committee, um, which is something that seems to be needed in an area that's so close to the coastal uh, area and wetlands. Um, so we have not addressed anything with, with science, climate change. Um, affordable housing is, is another thing that often gets brought up at, at Pluck, but we as a council have not necessarily um, taken, a, taken a position on it or, or advocated for more affordable housing in an area that definitely needs it. Um, also, we um, public safety, we have a public safety committee that has not met um, until March of 2021. So starting in January of 2020 till March of 2021, there were no public safety meetings during a global pandemic, which could arguably be one of the largest public safety crises we'll ever, um, we'll ever experience during our lifetime. So that could definitely be improved. Um, and I think Sylvia, there were some other issues that you wanted to speak to as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Heather. So social justice. Um, as the only woman of color who is currently on the neighborhood council, I feel this very deeply in every meeting. Uh, there is a disconnect on the current council uh, for people who have a diversity of perspectives, but also diversity of backgrounds and cultures. This is something that is not discussed or celebrated or included. And so with the rise of the last four to five years of hate crimes, um, there has been a, a huge a spike in uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes, a huge spike in uh, hate crimes against uh, 
people of Asian descent. And of course, um, our flashpoint that we had you know, last summer, in May of last summer, these things have not been allowed to be talked about or discussed in our current neighborhood council. And that's why it's so important that we have a social justice aspect. Heather has already spoken a little bit about the opportunities with a change uh, in terms of the board of things that we can do. But in terms of social justice, there are many other neighborhood councils that not only, as Marsha mentioned, have an environmental committee, but they also have a social justice committee. And so for example, um, a few months ago, because of the concerns that I've had over the rise of anti-Asian hate, um, I authored an inclusion statement, which I have seen throughout many other neighborhood councils. Remember we have 99, right? Um, and I talked to CORD about it. I provided uh, the statement to CORD for CORD to get through the Community Services Committee, because of course we have a Community Services Committee. Um, and as Heather mentioned, we do not have a homeless uh, committee, which we need, but I digress. Um, and that spent months in committee. During that time that it was in committee, it was completely watered down. And it was just a very, very short statement. It didn't mention um, any of the major issues that many of our community members who are becoming more and more diverse deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, our job as neighborhood council members is to help everyone feel included. And so that statement was watered down, but then when it made it to the agenda for our last meeting a few weeks ago, it was taken off. Even We couldn't even get a very watered down statement just saying that we include everyone that we want everyone to feel safe versus many other neighborhood councils who have said things. I knew this; it wasn't possible to say Black Lives Matter as many other neighborhood councils have said, but I was hoping to at least get a statement about um, including all people and to speak out against the anti-Asian hate as we do have a lot of community members who are of Asian descent. If our Congress can quickly pass a bill to stop anti-Asian discrimination and hate. I don't understand why our local neighborhood council can't say something very simple about it. And so that's my social justice piece where if we were as Democrats, if, if we don't only talk the talk, but we walk the walk, we will try to have people on our board who believe that everyone should be included and everyone belongs. And they have no problem saying that in a meeting. So changing the neighborhood council, uh, Westchester Playa bylaws. As Heather mentioned, we can add more committees. We need the environmental committee because we're so close to the coast. We need to add seats to the board. We don't have a youth seat. We have a lot of, I, I have a family of three young children and I'd love for them to see the neighborhood council in action and have an opportunity to take a leadership position and build that onto something else. But again, many other neighborhood councils have a youth seat, we do not. So we have a lot of opportunities to change the board. If as Democrats, we actually don't only talk the talk, but we walk the walk and we help elect more progressives. Um, and also in terms of the bylaws, currently, if any of you have an opportunity to read the bylaws, you might be surprised because the power resides within the president. Everything is at the president's, um, is the president's decision. So in terms of who gets appointed to committees, um, that's the president's decision. The other neighborhood council members don't have an opportunity to really bring anyone else to the table who we feel might also offer some benefit or some value to our board um, to a seat that is open. Um, additionally, in terms of the bylaws, the president decides what goes on the agenda. So again, when we have things that are dealing with the environment, things that are dealing with social justice, affordable housing, public safety, we didn't have a meeting for months when it's so important. We can't address any of those things unless the president allows for it to be on the agenda. There are so many things with the bylaws that create almost like a dictatorship and we're Democrats, we believe in democracy, right? So let's vote in progressives. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That concludes our, our presentation from the uh, current members of the Neighborhood Council. Thank you. Thank you so much. I learned so much. I hope everybody else learned so much. It's, I, I mean, I think when you talk about the things that are left out, these are core to our values as Democrats, as progressives, and to know that this is not part of the dialogue, that tells me that we need change. So we are going to hear from Andy Seawack now, and he's going to talk a little more about why Democrats, why a little bit more about how it relates from the national to the grassroots and why this really, why we should be so involved in this. Why should we care? Because there's more to say. <laughs> so here we go. Thank you, Andy. Hey, thank, thank you, Amis. Thanks for organizing. Oh. I think it's worth mentioning too that, you know, this is a neighborhood that voted for Joe Biden by a three to one margin. And I think Clinton won by a, not even a two to one margin. So it's increasingly a democratic community here in Westchester. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate, I'm Andy. I'm running for the District 12 seat in Osage. And tonight I'd just like to talk about some of my experiences uh, working in local government and political campaigns and relate why neighborhood councils are important for Democrats to, to support. Um, so I, I was involved in Democratic Party politics mostly when I was younger. I interned the DNC in, in the late 90s. Um, in 2000, for those of you who remember who Bill Bradley was, um, I led his uh, presidential campaign on the UC Santa Barbara campus, tried to get the vote for him. Um, I also volunteered in the Kerry campaign in 2004 and knocked on doors in Ohio and Nevada. Uh, my favorite memory was in 2003, while living in San Francisco, uh, someone I knew mentioned that a young woman was running for the district attorney's office and that I wanted to help out. She needed a ride to the Fisherman's Wharf Merchants Association endorsement meeting, and did I want to drive her there? I said, sure, what's her name? They said, oh, her name is Kamala Harris. So one day I, went, I drove and I, she got my old uh, Ford Taurus and I got to drive her uh, to this meeting and it was really fun. We both grew up in Berkeley. We had a lot to talk about. Um, she gave me some driving advice when I got too close to some, some pedestrians, but she was a lovely woman and it was a really great, great thing. Um, but over the last 10 years, I have not been involved in local democratic politics, but I worked in local government with Manhattan Beach and also with the Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce. And I spent a lot of time at City Hall and I would say that my experience working at both those cities, it was encouraging. You know, local government there is responsive. It's respectful of its citizens. And it may be unfair to compare neighborhood councils in well with well-heeled cities such as those two, but it really showed what a respectful self-government could look like. Um, so inspired by this, I looked to get involved with the neighborhood council. My seat was occupied, but I ended up being appointed to the Government Affairs Committee in 2018. Uh, my main issue was just to get more parks in the community. That, that's my major issue in running for uh, this seat. And I thought the neighborhood council would be a great way to achieve this. You know, I, when I first moved to this neighborhood in 2011, it was the first time in my life I could not walk to a park. You know, when the neighborhood was built in the 40s, it was built very quickly and there were no parks were dedicated at all. Um, There's no parks east of Lincoln, west of the 405 and north of Manchester. So working with the Education Government Affairs Committees, I was able to get a letter, I wrote a letter that was passed by the council in March to encourage LUSD to have its school ground used by the public during off hours. And this is a common arrangement in surrounding cities. I also learned actually this week that the city of San Diego, all of their elementary schools are open to the public as parks during off hours as well. So I intend to research that. But my experience was also a little bit less than satisfying. It took too long to get this passed. Committee chairs needlessly postpone meetings. So, you know, I feel like there's a lot of improvement that the neighborhood council could do. And just based on these experiences, I'd like to just list out a number of reasons why the neighborhood council is important, especially for Democrats to be involved with in this election. You know, if I had a tagline for neighborhood councils, it would be this, neighborhood councils make big city governance manageable. Neighborhood councils give you a chance to be heard. If you're a city council member in the city of LA, you're, more, you're, you're akin to a congressman. You represent hundreds of thousands of people. It is not very intimate. And so that's why who is on these councils is very important. It must be a very responsive and representative body. And as we know, the current council is not doing a good job of being this representative body for all the reasons Heather, Cord, and Sylvia said. In my experience, it has been very suspicious of those who disagree with it. It's stymies dissent. It is not open to new perspectives. By electing Democrats, we have a great opportunity to reverse this. You know, and secondly, at its best, the Democratic Party is a party where ideas come from the grassroots, 
from neighborhood activists and local leaders. You know, by contrast, the GOP feels very top down. Ideas such as child care tax credits, raising the minimum wage, pushing to reduce childhood poverty. These initiatives come from the bottom up. They don't come from lobbyists. They come from activists at the, at the bottom of the party or the base of the party. And so for this reason, Democrats should really prioritize and foster these types of grassroots organizations. You know, our leaders often rise up through them as well. Gavin Newsom began his political career in the San Francisco Parking and Traffic Commission. Ron Galpern, our city controller, is actually the first neighborhood council member elected to citywide office. So my message to Democrats is to really make these local elections a priority. Too many of us, and I, I'm guilty of this, have come out of the woodwork every two to four years for the big national elections with their pomp and circumstance. But if we want to stay an engaged party that is relevant to the needs and stances of everyday people, we should really nurture grassroots democratic institutions like neighborhood councils and give them the attention they deserve. So I encourage you all to, to please register to vote and get your friends to register to vote so we can get a neighborhood council that is representative of our, of our neighborhood, which I think we're all very frustrated by. But I think together we can make this happen. And I, I'm really glad I found this slate and it's been a really great experience. So uh, thank you for organizing and thank you for everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I just thank need a... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm gonna use the, just a point of clarification uh, from our Zoom host. When I said I was the only woman of color, I meant the only woman of color progressive who was on the neighborhood council. Right, thank you for clarifying. So yes, thank you. And Andy, thank you. I think we have heard several reasons why it matters. I think many of us can relate to getting involved on the national landscape, which I did for many years as well. And I didn't know until we bought a place. And when Heather, Heather was the one who ran for it first and told me she was running for neighborhood council. And I had no idea what it was, but here we are. And the word's out. We're going to continue to get the word out. And now we are going to move on to our slate. Some questions that I have that I'm going to pull up right now. And just to let you know, um, the questions that have come up already in the chat, we're going to try to address those in the end, in addition to, you know, to the questions that I have right now. And also, I wanted to add that if at the very end of this, we're going to end it at 8.30, be respectful of everybody's time. But if there's anybody that's having trouble registering, I know that's been a bit of a hassle. You're more than welcome to stay on. I will stay on and help you through it if anybody else would like to stay on. But no one is obligated. I mean, we really only, only need one person, maybe two, because I'm not always so savvy with this techie stuff. But we'll get through this. So please, if you have any questions about ensuring you get your ballot. Um, please stay on and we will help you or you can always email us or email me. Uh, okay, so I have some questions. First question, why should you vote to increase representation on the neighborhood council, which is a perfect follow up to what we were just talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I can take that question. Again, I'm Faniza and I am running for the education seat. And I thought about this question long and hard and I tried to think about like, what did I wanna communicate the most? And I settled on something that is personal. So for me, representation matters because it creates a space for the voices that are sometimes silenced or disregarded because of our race or gender, class, education level, or income. I'm an immigrant from Guyana, the only English speaking country in South America. I'm East Indian and I subscribe to a mixture of Caribbean and American cultures. In this pocket of Los Angeles, known as Westchester, Playa del Rey, and Playa Vista, I am almost always the only one with this identity which means I'm the only, I'm always the only one walking into the room and I represent something different. Sometimes that can be disconcerting and then sometimes it can be empowering. I have chosen to view it as an opportunity to draw from my multicultural and multinational experiences to provide that unique perspective. Representation matters to me because it allows access to the various tables 
that are not readily available to people of color and sometimes women, AKA people like me. Therefore, it is incumbent upon me to use my voice when I'm given that access. My access allows me to speak on behalf of a multitude of people. I want to provide a voice to those who might go unheard on issues such as race, social justice, and inclusion. I think we're all channeling each other today. <laughs> I may not be able to speak for everyone, but I can lend my voice as a woman and as a person of color. I also want our students to see people like them on our local body of government because I want them to become more civically engaged. So what does, the, what does this have to do with the neighborhood council and you as a voter? As a democratic voter, I think you more than any other group understand the importance of representation. You understand the importance of representation if we want to advocate for diverse voices and needs, equality and just causes. Our local government should reflect our community so we can have active participation and reduce the distrust. Our current, our current council is not representative of our local community, racially, by age, or by gender. The council, so for you, what do we want? I call on you to vote for the people that are on this call that are candidates because we reflect the community. Your, vo your vote is going to give a voice to, that, to those that are unheard. So we really, really hope to have you register to vote and participate in this election because it matters. It may be just local, it may be just for an advisory board, but the power is in our voices. Even as community members, we can attend committee meetings. So please register to vote and also attend the meetings and participate. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Faniza. You know, the last thing you mentioned about attending the meetings, right? I was, I made a joke in the beginning that this feels a little bit like how neighborhood council meetings were <laughs> until certain issues became an issue. And then we have hundreds and hundreds and a whole other situation. But luckily the silver lining of Zoom allows for many of us who maybe didn't have the means to get to a meeting. And I can say for myself as a busy juggling mom who's working at the jail, home with the kids everywhere, I can attend a meeting and I have no shame. I might be folding laundry in the middle of it. I might be doing something else, but our voices matter. And by default, because of our family commitments, we shouldn't be excluded. So it's really nice that we have this option. And it looks like we might be keeping these options more available. So there's no reason that you cannot tune in, wash your dishes at the same time and make public comment when it's your time to talk because these issues matter. And it's that that's the time, this is the time to get our voice out and these are opportunities for us to get our voice out. So thank you so much for addressing that. And let's see here, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Okay, so this is a good one. And I feel very strongly about this one as well. I, I have mentioned the, the importance of transparency and uh, here we go. One of the concerns of your slate or one of the concerns your slate has had with the current neighborhood council is the lack of transparency and outreach to the community. Tell us about that. And how would you plan to change things? I'd be happy to answer that one. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, as you guys have heard from many people tonight, the current council is not reflective of our community. Um, and transparency is a major issue. Um, so for some of those examples about that, many of the seats on the Westchester Playa board have remained open for years, despite several people who've been involved at the committee level actively seeking to fill those open positions. Yet, now that the election is coming up, the current president has quickly appointed several people who she knows personally to fill those seats, despite their lack of pre previous involvement with the council or with committees. For another example, my opponent, he seems like a nice guy, he probably is. But I also know that his work in the public affairs advocacy has generated some conflicts of interest. He's a representative of Gateway LA with the airport, United and the developer Legato to name a few. 
And in recent years, he's recused himself from many of the neighborhood council discussions and votes. And I just think that with so many business conflicts, it's really nearly impossible to be an effective advocate or a voice for our community. I've been going door to door and making phone calls with my slate members over the last few weeks. And it's clear that many don't know about the council, that it exists or how they're being represented. So I'd love to work with CORD and the outreach committee to help facilitate the involvement of a greater number of stakeholders. Um, as we've seen during this pandemic, in some ways it's been an opportunity because we've had a lot more participation from the community members on Zoom as it's been easier for people to join. And we'd like to be able to continue that even when we go back to in-person meetings to have that option. I also think that we can increase the use of social media in a coordinated manner to first help educate the community about the issues that we face, and then also to solicit feedback from community members. We also need to engage those who work, not just live in the neighborhood, as they are equal stakeholders. We need to consider our younger uh, stakeholders. We need to consider our renters, not just our homeowners. And overall, just the greater number of voices that we can facilitate to provide input, the more diverse and inclusive our representation will be. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, so it looks like I said a little bit of what you're talking about, but that it really has been helpful having this option. So um, it would behoove more of us to utilize this option so that we can keep it. And if it's not available, ask for it. Again, using our voice, so thank you. But we're gonna move on to the next question here. How can we, as a community, address homelessness in our neighborhood? This is the, the question of the evening, right? Big question. Thank you, Amini. <laughs> this has been such a big <laughs> issue lately. So hang in there with me, guys. Um, I have a background in social work and I'm the co-founder of Grassroots Neighbors. I've spent years talking to people who are experiencing homelessness and now navigating a complicated bureaucracy. I've personally seen many people stabilize into permanent housing and thrive. I've also lost too many clients to premature death, incarceration, or illness turned disability that meant the housing the person did finally receive was an institution at great taxpayer expense. What I know that while no two stories are the same, the research and data is very clear that the number one cause of homelessness is the lack of affordable housing. So there's a few things that we as a community can do, specifically what the Neighborhood Council can do. So the first thing is prevention. According to Halasa, last year, we housed people at a rate of 207 per day, while people became homeless at a rate of 227 per day. So despite huge gains in our ability to provide housing and services, we're simply not able to keep up. Too many neighbors are choosing between food, rent, and utility bills and are just one bad day away from homelessness. I can confirm through my work at GRN, this worrisome fact does impact residents in Playa del Rey, Playa Vista, and Westchester. The Neighborhood Council could be proactive to bring resources together and educate the community on programs that are designed to keep people housed. This is particularly significant for our seniors and disabled residents who are on fixed incomes and would not be able to compete in the current housing market if they were displaced. We could be advocating for higher density, smart development, and more affordable housing. As Cord mentioned with the Pluck Committee, we could be doing so much to fight for affordable housing as a priority for our neighborhood. We can advocate for stable situations for unhoused people while they pursue housing. LASA recently reported housing, LASA reported that housing someone takes an average about 150 days. That is months to get someone document ready to enter housing. A lot can go wrong during that time. One of the biggest barriers to completing this process is an unhoused person lacks safety and stability. No one is advocating for unmitigated sprawling encampments. That is the current state of our city and it must be addressed. People are frequently told where they're not welcome. We need to answer the question of where they can be. This stability can look like safe camping, safe parking, tiny homes, motel rooms. It can take many forms. Stability is a key piece to any kind of mental health or substance abuse treatment. You cannot expect someone to benefit from any kind of mental health treatment if their basic need for a place to sleep is not met. Our neighborhood council could be a leading voice in advocating for a program that would meet the needs of both housed and unhoused, asking for assurances, timelines, and evidence-based methods within our own community that would improve safety, cleanliness, and quality of life for everyone. 
accountability. The community and the neighborhood council could specifically, uh, specifically the NC, can play a huge role in following up with agencies and holding them accountable for results. An engaged NC could collaborate to remove barriers and collect the necessary information to advocate for additional resources. Finally, relationship and community building. I really believe that when someone becomes unhoused, they become ostracized. People stare at them, mistreat them. They're frequently victims of violence and theft and are more likely to have police interactions and arrests. The psychological toll that takes on someone over time cannot be overstated. I really believe that if we expect people to remain invested and engaged in our community, then we, those of us who have the privilege of being housed right now, must invest in relationship building and affirming the humanity of others. The Neighborhood Council has many opportunities to support a vibrant, healthy community and to come alongside its homeless population and proactively problem solve. The Neighborhood Council has a unique role of being made up of private citizens, business owners, members of community organizations. The very nature of the Neighborhood Council brings together at the same table the types of stakeholders who can partner with service providers and the city government to make a real change. But we as a community have to decide that being creative and proactive is our priority. Myself and the other members of the Westchester Forward Slate intend to prioritize finding those solutions that work and advocating for all of our neighbors. So it's really important that we all get out the vote this time. So thank you guys. Thank you, Stephanie. And I just uh, wanted to add one more piece to this that a lot of people, I mean, I've even seen some of the comments that come up, send them to jail, send them out. But then again, this is again, fiscally irresponsible. It's inhumane. I mean, there's, there's still no solution to this because at the end of the day, if that's all we care about, I mean, some fiscally, it's really just costing us so much more and we're not helping the situation. And in terms of the misinformation, I mean, I had someone today ask me, well, are you for or against? It's no one wants people camping in the streets. And I'm really glad that you clarified that because that seems to be the crux of what people are deciding is the issue of this election. But I think that's actually one thing we could agree on is that we don't wanna see people living in tents. That's not the ideal. This is not a good example of us taking care of our people, but we do need solutions. We need to face our solutions and not bury our head in the sand as I've heard many people describe the current situation. So thank you very much. Moving along, this is another issue that cannot be addressed unless we believe in science. So um, relatively speaking, what are your stances on the proposed wetlands restoration and the current use of Jefferson Boulevard for RV parking? Thanks, Amanice. Uh, I'm gonna take this one. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Um, I just wanna say, I, I, I hope that, before I answer that question, I just hope everyone is as impressed with the not just the questions, but this, these candidates. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of being on this slate and meeting with these candidates on a weekly basis um, for you know, a few months now. And um, just, I hope you all hear the, the intelligence and the care and the thoughtfulness these people have uh, with regard to issues in our community. So anyway, it's been an honor and enriching for me to be on this slate. All right, regarding the proposed wetlands restoration project, we know a lot of things. Uh, we know 15 million tax dollars have already been spent developing the plan and analyzing its major alternatives. Um, even though the environmental impact report has been recently finalized and it's over 2000 pages by my count, there are still many more steps that, need to, that would be required, including now uh, new permits from the Army Corps of Engineers who have recently been engaged. Our slate uh, recently devoted an hour to talk with Marsha Hanscom about the project and she's here today, I can see. Um, some of us, including myself, also attended a, a Zoom symposium offered by UCLA on the subject. That latter one um, avoided addressing the concerns of those opposed to the plan, but it was still um, nonetheless very informative. It's uh, astounding how complicated it is uh, um, to, um, have massive earth moving projects near the ocean. They presented examples of unintended consequences and lessons learned in other major efforts. Um, it's also interesting that this piece of wetland has, ha has varied between being predominantly saltwater and predominantly freshwater fed, um, both due to natural causes, as well as the influence of 
200 years of human land use. Um, and there are different views on what the new ideal should be, even among experts. Uh, Marsha was very clear to point out that the proposal included many upgrades to the gas company facilities. Some of those are helping to close things up or get them out of the reserve, but many other aspects would serve to build out their capabilities, which is somewhat antithetical to the goal of closing this facility, which the LA City Council has already voted to recommend to Gavin Newsom, which makes our slate very skeptical. It remains to be seen if that city council motion was merely symbolic or will have teeth to it, and whether there is a short-term alternative option for the purpose that the current gas facility serves, while California does the long-term and very necessary transition to 100% renewable energy, which I think we all agree is the goal. Um, and again, we all know the plan is a nine-year phase plan, and it has a current price tag of $250 million. This uh, includes moving an enormous amount of earth. This would obviously include disrupting the current ecosystem, but of course, in the hopes of engineering a new and supposedly more natural one. This also has most of our slate members quite skeptical. There are a myriad of other uncertainties and concerns, but what might be the biggest issue is that this whole thing is mired in shady relationships between so-called environmental groups like Heal the Bay, and over a decade of money and influence coming from the gas company. This is also a big red flag for us. So bottom line is that we all, while we humbly continue to educate ourselves on this topic, the consensus of our slate is to be in opposition to this proposal. The second issue, um, the RV parking that lines Jefferson. But you know, bottom line up front, we do want them relocated. Uh, I did a self-guided tour of this area uh, this week. There are currently about 25 lived-in vehicles parked just west of Lincoln. Most of the folks keep things tidy, but some of them have built out adjacent structures or living spaces that encroach toward the walking path. The walking path is still clear, but one also sees evidence of a couple of places where folks have encroached beyond the fence and into the protected and sensitive area. Furthermore, that area was always intended for guest parking to enjoy the reserve. And now, of course, there are no parking spots because all the RVs and other cars that are there. I've heard this whole area described as being a pigsty, but to be honest, the amount of trash currently strewn about during my visit was surprisingly minimal. The amount that you could be cleaned up in a day by two or three people. It's not clear if RV parking was ever sanctioned on this street. The apps and maps that the city started providing in 2016 are no longer functioning online. It's notable that the initial ordinance to identify certain streets as acceptable had a sunset clause that expired in 2018. We are actually researching the current status of that ordinance and whether it was officially extended or not. In reality, in practice, the RVs on Jefferson are actually getting ticketed but they're only getting ticketed once a month to the tune of $75, which is clearly not a deterrent. A um, couple of the gentlemen I spoke to called it their rent. Um, Mike Bonin's proposal appears to indicate that a solution to illegal or undesirable RV parking should be to redesignate some of the rentable RV spots at Doc Weiler parking lot for those RVs currently parked in undesirable places. A couple of the folks I spoke with on Jefferson said they would gladly relocate to Doc Weiler parking lot so long as it didn't cost $80 a day. So barring a better alternative, that is something our council should support. Our slate definitely sees homelessness as an expanding crisis, as Stephanie said, one that has to urgently be managed in the short term right now. So in summary, I hope this assures you that our slate of candidates are the ones that are going to be the most attentive and least conflicted about the issues related to the wetlands. And if that alone isn't enough, we would like to lobby for the Neighborhood Council to add a special environmental seat, or as Marcia said in our comments, an environmental committee that the public could sit on, of course, and to go along with the other special seats that we already have, like the religious seat and the youth seat and the educational seat. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So I think at the very least, we need an environmental committee. <laughs> shouldn't just be kept to one event every few years. And Louie, that was some very sticky territory, probably literally. So 
Thank you for clarifying that for us. Um, I just wanted to add one little thing. We talk a lot about the slate, but I did invite two other people who aren't on our slate, but I wholeheartedly believe are the people that will do the best job and they espouse the same values that I have and I'm happy to also endorse them. And I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. That is Corey Burkett and Martha Holt, who is not here this evening, but I wanna make sure I mention her because I think that that, and I don't remember which position she's for, but that is the person who I believe is the person for the job. So. Moving on, I have two more questions and I think we're doing all right with time. It's 8.12. We might still have our time for a little Q&A after. Let's see. So what group would your outreach focus on and how do you plan to increase involvement? Which is actually a really good question because we had a lot of the outreach uh, talk and this is one form of outreach, but I'm sure there are many more ways. So does anybody have any take on that? Uh, I will take that one. I just want to mention that I've been having random violent sneezing attacks all day. So if it starts, I'll try and mute myself because nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> so, just to let you know. Um, thanks for having me. I want to kind of expand on some of the things some of the other people have talked about. Uh, Sylvia mentioned it. Louis just said something about it. Christy talked about it. Um, we need a youth seat. We need to expand our outreach to the youth of this community. We, I, I have two kids. I have one in high school. He's in ninth grade, one in middle school in seventh grade. Um, my ninth grader was in the model United Nations program run by the YMCA. My seventh grader is now in it. My ninth grader is now in the teens and government program. They're very robust programs. Um, the high school group, the teens and government program this past year, normally in the past, they focus on statewide politics and state or statewide government. Um, because of the pandemic and the way that things were working and they couldn't all meet the same way, they really pivoted this past year to focus in on local government, city government, citywide, neighborhood wide. Uh, they had their last conference um, maybe a couple months ago, and of all of the delegates from around LA area, that's who they kind of grouped together this time. So the city of LA, they had one conference and they gave out four outstanding delegate uh, awards at the end of this conference. And two of them were from Westchester. Now, those 50% of these high number awards from the entire city of LA, this means that the kids in our area, they're involved. They want to learn about it. They know what's going on. They, they want to do something about it. I have kids who are friends with my ninth grader who want to vote already, and they're not 16 yet. But we're asking kids who are 16 to vote for us, and they don't have a voice on this council. They're not a part of any of the committees. They're, they don't have a seat. Um, so that's, that's really discounting and disrespecting their, the voices that, and the opinions and the ideas that they have. And you know what? I already know that my kids are way smarter than me. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm guessing you're probably in a similar situation. It's just, it's the way things work, right? Why aren't we using that energy and that, that I, those ideas and that creativity and that innovation? Because that could do so much for us on the council. They might solve stuff for us that we never even thought about. Um, so I did a little research uh, when I was, when I've been thinking about my, kind of my passion for when I was running. And I thought, wait, who else has these seats? We have 99 neighborhood councils in the LA area and 44 of them have a youth representative seat. I don't know why we don't. We have over 10 schools, more, I don't even know how many schools in this area. We have tons of families, lots of kids from babies all the way up through wherever. We have Otis, we have LMU. Why aren't we getting them involved? So we need to have a youth representative seat, but that takes a while because bylaws take a while. It has to be put into the bylaws and then they have to be, you know, whatever. How do we get them involved right away? Let's get them to be part of our committees. Let's, why aren't they sitting on the educa education committee? They are the primary stakeholders of that education committee piece. So I'm not sure why they're not even asked to contribute there, but let's ask maybe the high schools all to send a representative and let's talk to the, the students in LMU and Otis and ask what is it about the neighborhood that you see as issues that affect you? What are the things that you want? Let's talk to the middle schools. Let's talk to the elementary schools. I mean, why not? These are kids that have great ideas. Let's make this and give them these opportunities to do more. And if we do this, we're helping to build better citizens. We're helping to build kids 
and create citizens who are more involved, who are more inspired to do things, who are going to be better informed voters instead of not voting, or will be critically thoughtful about what they are listening to, what they are looking for, the information that they are taking in. If we're giving those opportunities to them, this doesn't mean they're all going to go out and run for office, but at least they'll, you know, put a critical eye toward the issues at hand, what's happening, and how they can vote. So, like I said, these kids, they're mine are way smarter than I am. My husband and I knew that from day five. But let's let's take those brains and all that innovation and let's do something with it. Let's take it and infuse that youth energy into the council because I really think we need that. And based on the demographics of the area, it's very underrepresented. So I would love to get these kids involved as much as possible. Thanks. Thank you. As someone who has started doing work in this community that has to be family friendly because that's what I am now, I'm part of a family. And if I want to get involved, my kids are going to have to be with me I had chills when you were speaking about that. And social media and technology alone, we need our youth. I mean, they can help us with all the things we've been talking about. They're amazing. So thank you. Yes, underutilized, underrepresented. Um, we can go on about that forever. So let's get to the next question. Can you, thank you, Jenna. Can you give us an update on the community plan, uh, on the community plan update for Westchester Playa and how stakeholders can get involved in the process. Another mystery area, but I'm hoping someone can possibly address yeah. that. Yes, thank you, Amani. So I will take that one. So thank again, I'm, I'm Corey Burkett and I'm running for residential seat 10 in Westport Heights. And I've been very involved with the planning and land use committee over the years with the desire to learn more about our local development projects. I live in Westport Heights, not too far from the busy street of La Tejera. So my neighbors and I have faced a number of development issues and threats over the years. And I learned about the community plan update for Wester, Westchester Playa when a concerned neighbor forwarded me a link with a map showing a proposed zoning change to our street. I didn't learn about the community plan update from the neighborhood council. So I believe that there needs to be more outreach from the planning and land use committee to the community about this plan. I reconnected with some former neighborhood council colleagues that I had worked with before, um, and I asked them to please put me to work on this community plan update and that I would do anything I could to help with it and to respond to the city um, to this issue. So this, this issue with the community plan, it tends to be kind of one of those subjects that people don't wanna hear about or talk about because it's boring and it is, when people hear the term zoning, they kind of automatically tune out, but it really is an important issue. And it's actually very connected to our crisis with our unhoused because we desperately need more affordable housing. And um, we need more truly affordable housing, not more market rate high rises. So when I began talking to my neighbors about the community plan update, of course, most people didn't know that it was happening or what it was. So if you're not sure what it is, in a nutshell, it's a blueprint from the city that sets forth neighborhood specific goals related to housing and development with some proposed zoning changes. And a lot of people just kind of tune out because they hear zoning and they're like, mm. but it's really important that you stay engaged in this process. Um, the city is currently in the draft concept phase, which means that they are reviewing the feedback that they've received from the community and they are now revising the plan and they will release a new plan in a few months, I'm told, that will reflect the community's input. Um, last summer, I was involved with the subcommittee of the planning and land use committee from the neighborhood council. Um, it contained some current and former neighborhood council members and we really wanted to represent the desires and concerns of our community residents when it came to the community plan update. Uh, we worked together, each taking on a different geographic section of Westchester Playa to revise parts of the plan that we didn't feel were aligned with the goals of thoughtful growth and adding affordable housing. So we submitted a very detailed report to the city with our recommendations. And some of these things included adding density and affordable housing, 
um, in some locations near transit oriented villages. Um, we also suggested creating enhanced walkability and encouraging the creation of more green space and parks. We wanted to create more opportunities for affordable housing throughout our community. Um, and also preserve the affordable housing that we have now, including low residential um, and missing middle. So those are our neighborhoods with duplexes and triplexes. Um, we also wanted to preserve land use historically designated as R1 as minimal residential. So of course, with any proposed changes to our zoning and adding housing, there have to be considerations for proper infrastructure, transportation, traffic, and safety. And the neighborhood council's job should be to make the community aware of this update so that stakeholders can provide feedback and advocate for goals that are important to them. I encourage you to stay engaged in this process. There are some proposed zoning changes to parts of Westchester that have the potential to actually remove some of our most affordable housing in our most diverse neighborhoods in favor of market rate high rise development. And we we, we've had, we also have a very unique opportunity, I think, to with the community plan to design a more user-friendly and walkable downtown Westchester with modern dining and retail options. Um, I know that our community is longing for this. And I frequently hear my neighbors say that they wish they had more healthy dining options, more nightlife spots, um, more small retail businesses that they can frequent. My desire is to continue to work with the neighborhood council to support thoughtful development, create additional affordable housing that we desperately need, and work towards the goal of creating a walkable downtown Westchester. It's important to strike a balance between growth and modernization, while also preserving what makes our community special and prioritizing a sustainable environment. The city is set to release an updated draft in a few months, and they're scheduling an additional round of meetings with our community members to give them feedback. So please stay engaged, give them feedback um, when the next draft is released. And um, if anyone has any questions about the process, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey. Um, Account, a transparency. <laughs> transparency. I keep hearing transparency is a theme, but um, we need it. So I want to pass along to Liz. Liz has been taking care of the questions um, in, in the chat. So here we go. I think we have time for maybe two, maybe. We'll see how things go. Yes. You know what? Martha Holt just popped in. I know mom life keeps us busy. Let me um, let her unmute herself so she can introduce herself to the participants that are here really quick, and then we'll jump to the questions. Martha, you should be able to unmute. There you go, friend. Hi, everybody. I am so sorry. This is just absolutely so embarrassing. I just completely got caught up in other things and forgot. So thank you for Sylvia for reminding me. Um, I am here running with um, for residential seat six, and um, I'm really excited to be a part of all this. So carry on. All right, awesome, Martha. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Perfect. So I think a lot of the questions were answered. Um, <clears throat> Marsha, I know you had a question about the difference between residential seats and like an at-large seat. I think um, people in the chat were really jumping in and sharing that. Um, it really just gives a diversity of uh, stakeholders. Does uh, maybe Cord or Sylvia want to jump in and answer that? Is there something more specific? Maybe. Oh, I, go, I was going to say, I, I think court is gone. Okay, go ahead, Sylvia. Uh, it, it just it just represents like we represent a specific area. So I represent North Kentwood. Um, you know, Heather was representing West Westchester. Um, so each seat uh, represents a specific area or district. And then the at large seats, you know, they represent a larger part of the community. It's, it's just as simple as that. Perfect. Um, and I know, at, like we've said a lot of times, the all of the seats, all of the boundaries, all of those things are all written in the bylaws. So I know that's something that um, the slate and a lot of candidates have been talking about, you know, making sure that our seats really reflect our community. Um, there was questions in the chat about the religious seat and is that a conflict? Um, so I know it's something that um, a lot of the candidates have been discussing about what are some things to think about um, as far as bylaw changes. Another question was about um, 
having registered lobbyists and consultants on. And I know Christy really jumped in and um, answered some of that in regards to her opponent specifically. Um, but does anybody else have questions? It says, um, what do you think about there being uh, lobbyists and consultants who are serving on the neighborhood council um, as there could be conflict of interest? Heather, I think that, that's part of why, I, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, um, I think that's part of why I'm so excited to run with this group of people who genuinely have, you know, interest in bettering their community. And um, for so many, I don't know if I'm lagging, but for, for so many years, um, so many different people on the council have had to recuse themselves for votes or have voted with a conflicting interest. And I think it's really nice that we have a group of people who are just organically interested in bettering their community for just the betterment of the community and for everyone who lives here, works here, uh, or has goes to school here or attends um, church or has property here. I think it's really nice to have a group of people who are just in this specifically for the betterment of Westchester Playa del Rey, Playa Vista. Perfect. Um, there was another question about have the candidates reached out to Mike Bonin or Mayor Garcetti? This is an apolitical race. And um, I know that was a question that I've heard from people during canvassing, you know, um, has the council member, you know, supported this candidate and um, he's not allowed to. So I know that for a fact, I see Sylvia shaking her head. Um, he's not allowed to publicly endorse uh, candidates. Um, but I think based on what you guys heard tonight from this group of candidates, you know, um, being a political ally is always something that's advantageous when you're trying to get things done. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, is something we could say without saying uh, endorsement, right? Okay. <laughs> um, and then there was lots of questions from Marcia, Marcia about the um, Biona wetlands, but I think Louie did a really great job um, answering them. Marcia is giving me the thumbs up. Um, and like we said, it is a sticky situation because there's so many um, outside forces and all of those kind of things um, in regards to that space. And then uh, the last question that Robert's been dropping in the chat is about the North Side project, um, about the federal lawn, land that's north of Westchester Parkway. Um, that is a current project going forward uh, through the Airport Relations Committee. Does anybody want to jump in and share a little bit about that? I'm hesitant to Liz because you're our expert like literally if if we all get elected when it comes time to airport stuff we're just going to be like Liz what's going on so do you want to share about that because you are a progressive sure. involved in the process <laughs> I'm a progressive involved in the process I'm the last house before the airport so I'm very involved in the uh north side runway project um it is going to be a gigantic I, I was going to say sorry Sorry to interrupt. I just think it's important to note that you've been trying to get on the airport relations committee for months and the process of getting you on that committee is, is difficult because it's left up to discretion, like one individual discretion is, is sort of. So I think that's Correct. just important to mention that you're, you're trying to get your voice be heard and you're trying to get a committee that really matters to you based on where you live and your interests and um, you've been, you've been blocked a little bit. So so just that question, just so Robert knows, um, that project is moving forward. There's in a, they're in the RFP phase right now. Um, they're getting bids from the two uh, developers for that project. And then once that happens and one developer uh, will get the bid, there'll be lots and lots of community outreach. Um, so that'll be good. But once again, it's really the job of the neighborhood council to advertise that. And um, not just people that are in the know, but that everyone knows. That's my saying because it's what happens sometimes in politics. Um, and the last question I just want to pose, it's 831. Somebody wrote in the chat, do the presidents of other neighborhood councils have the same power as ours? Um, I think everybody could, <laughs> everybody's shaking their head. Um, everything is based on the bylaws. So I know people have said it again and again, the bylaws are super important. And the only way bylaws get changed or updated is by getting people that have diversity of thought and diversity of ideas. And that's why we really wanted to hold this event. So um, I just want to thank Amanice for, you know, putting this on for all of these wonderful candidates and for the people that came and, um, you know, joined us tonight. I know it's never a great to be on Zoom in the evening, but it's been a wonderful opportunity for the community to be more engaged. So Amanice, you want to close us out? 
Yes, uh, really quickly. This was so refreshing. So thank you all. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed getting to know everything you told us. And I think others, I hope, learned as well. And we will be sharing this as well because other people have expressed interest in wanting to learn more. And I think the last thing I want to say is that the election is still on. I mean, the campaigning is still on. We still have to June 1st to get a ballot. So please make sure you get your ballot and make sure you and get other people involved as well. If you enjoyed meeting our people, the people I wholeheartedly endorse and want to see represent me and my family, if you agree, let's get more people involved in this because that's really where the problem is that we don't have enough engaged people and there's no excuse for that. As Democrats, we can do better. So um, we're gonna do some text banking, I think, some phone banking. I mean, there's stuff getting you know in, in the mix and if you would like to get involved, please reach out to me. Is there anything else? I do want some kind of add on the getting involved part of it because uh, I think that's where we're at right now. We have a week left. I think what, what I want to add is because there was a question um, that popped up in the chat at one point I saw about past NC elections getting a little bit shady with um, uh, conservative opposition. And our opposition is not above some shady business. So right now, it's critically important that everyone, all hands on deck, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. Right now we need to get every possible fellow Democrat progressive person to vote. Um, it is tricky to get a ballot. So it's important that we talk to them early and often to follow up with them and help them get their ballots. So thank you guys. Thank you, Amanis. My, my pleasure. If anybody else has anything final to add about that, I think we're good, right? And we're forever hold your peace.